Hello everybody, my name is Craig Bennett and I am the founder and owner of Tech Fuse and Help. And I'm AIE. And today we are going to talk about Kepler's Laws of Planetary Motion. These are three laws, like the Newton's three laws, but uh, these laws pertain to mostly orbiting bodies. Now, as far as things goes, there's going to be parts of these laws that we will break up into multiple videos. And the reason for this is this this video will give you a basic general overview on the Kepler laws. And if you have any particular questions between now and when I'm done with the subject, then this will allow me to actually go in more detail in those questions. Also, uh, especially the last law, and I'll get into that when we get to it, but that law will definitely be broken up into multiple videos. Also, uh, before we moved on, um, one thing I also want to mention is the second law deals with, or you can deal with the second law in Lagrange points, and it might be a while before I get into Lagrange points due to KSP is not really good to show that with, and I'm trying to find a good software to really show you that, but until that comes, I might have to uh, just use paint to show you it at worst case scenario, but until then, I highly suggest that you look that up. It's a very fascinating stuff, but uh, since we're going through the basics and trying to get into the event, that is a little more event, so we got some time until that comes. So anyways, without further ado, AI, please read off Kepler's three laws. The first law is, the path of the planets about the sun is elliptical in shape with the center of the sun being located at one focus. This is known as the law of ellipses. The second law is, an imaginary line drawn from the center of the sun to the center of the planet will sweep out equal areas in equal intervals of time. This law is also known as the law of equal areas. Lastly, the ratio of the squares of the periods of any two planets is equal to the ratio of the cubes of their average distances from the sun. The last law is known as the law of harmonies. Before we get into detail, let me mention right now, planets, suns, and so on can be anything as far as the terminology. For example, this law will still work as if you replace the, when we say sun, with earth, and when we say planets, you can replace that with you. It's just that as long as you have a large mass that's uh, much larger than the small mass, so it works very well with satellites and asteroids and certain other things. Anyways, before you can understand the first law, you need to understand what focal points are and how to find them and make them. And by the way, as far as things goes, since we're dealing with two focal points, the the right way to say it is foci, and that's F-O-C-I. The foci always lie on the major longest axis, spaced equally each side of the center. If the major axis and minor axis are the same length, the figure is a circle and both foci are at the center. Reshape the ellipse above and try to create this situation. If you have an ellipse with known major and minor axis lengths, you can find the location of the foci using the formula shown on the screen. The major and minor axis lengths are the width and height of the ellipse where F is the distance from each focus to the center, J is the semi-major axis, and N is the semi-minor axis. Given an ellipse with a known height and width, you can find uh, two foci using a compass and a straight edge. Basically draw a cross axis through the middle of the known ellipse and move the compass to the end of the minor axis and then draw two arcs on the major axis. Label where the two arcs meet as F1 and F2 and you have focal 1 and focal 2. There is other ways to finding the focal points. For example, you can use light and sound to find the points. This is true, but it's a lot harder to do that, and it's a lot harder to explain it. 
especially with uh, limited animations and whatnot. But for the most part, the uh, method that I just give you with the straight edge and compass will be the easiest way, or what I felt like is the easiest way. Of course, it's up to you to feel which is easier or not. Now, as far as things go, the one thing to note is if you put the points on top of each other, then you are left with a circle as an orbit. Anyways, it's also important to note that on one point, the focal point, you have a large center of mass object, and the other you have nothing. It does not really matter as far as which focal point has something and the other doesn't. It's just that you have a large center of mass, being a sun, planet, whatever, a lot larger than the orbiting body and then you have nothing a void space in the other end unless you want a circle obviously which will be the sun being on both points or planet or whatever it is that's a large mass now to Kepler's second law this law describes the speed at which any given planet will move while orbiting the sun the speed at which any planet moves through space is constantly changing. A planet moves fastest when it is closest to the sun and slowest when it is furthest from the sun. Yet, if an imaginary line were drawn from the center of the planet to the center of the sun, that line would sweep out the same area in equal periods of time. For instance, if an imaginary line were drawn from the Earth to the sun, then the area swept out by the line in every 31 day month would be the same. The areas formed when the Earth is closest to the Sun can be approximated as a wide but short triangle, whereas the areas formed when the Earth is farthest from the Sun can be approximated as a narrow but long triangle. These areas are the same size. Since the base of these triangles are shortest when the Earth is farthest from the Sun, the Earth would have to be moving more slowly in order for this imaginary area to be the same size as when the Earth is closest to the Sun. So basically a planet or a large object with a low mass moves fastest when it's closest to the sun or a large object with a large mass. Now as far as the last law, it is important to note the differences between Newton's and Kepler's version of the third law. As shown, the Kepler's law is cleaner, but it's only useful for when a year dealing with solar systems it's only useful when the there is two bodies interacting with one another and one of them is much more massive than the other this means we can discard the mass of the second one the smaller body however Newton's inversion kicks in when both bodies have a similar or equal mass and uh, this means the problem becomes more complex and you have to count for both bodies as far as how much mass both bodies have and their interaction between each other. And um, that means Kepler's original version of the law will not work. Typically Kepler's law is useful in things like satellites, stations, small rocks, and so on that is orbiting Earth. However, it's not so much useful when you're talking about dead planets orbiting one another or when the moon is orbiting a planet. Obviously this is giving the size of the planet or moon is similar from one another. Because how long it takes to make these videos and to make the script, to do the research, because even though I learned a lot of this in school and used it in practice, I still want to make sure everything is 100% right, especially updated with the new knowledge and whatnot if there is new knowledge and so on i'm going to talk more in depth about this last law and the differences between newton's version and kepler's version later in a, another video however the next video will be on gravity where it might come from because there's theories on where it might come from and there's very, and I'll explain why it's theories today and why it'll be known fact tomorrow. But um, 
I, I'll explain where it might come from and so on. If you like this video or if you found it helpful, then please help me out by leaving a like, subscribe, and share this video with as many people as you know, especially given if it's a classroom setting, that way more people can get help by this. And if you got any questions, feel free to leave a comment below or feel free to e email me through techreviewsandhelp.com or you can email me through YouTube. Have a great day.